Good morning, everyone. I am so glad to see everyone out tonight. And to be honest with you, I'm so glad to finally be in the pulpit so I can stop being nervous. Uh, I am so happy to be here. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And Ryan, thank you so much for leading that song. I greatly appreciate that. For I am yours and you are mine. I love that sentiment of that song. And not only that, but we're going to be having an analogy this morning of water. So that song just fit perfectly with the lesson. This morning, everyone, oh, it would help if I turn that on. This morning, I'd like us to start with something I'm sure you're all familiar with, being in a landlocked state of Tennessee, the World Ocean Race. I know this is something that probably everybody follows. It's probably your homepage on your computer, but uh, let's talk about the World Ocean Race for just a second. So the World Ocean Race, for all sailing enthusiasts, you already know this, it is a race that is actually around the world. It happens every single year, believe it or not, and it is a race around the world. It is not continuous, so there are different legs that you take. There's breaks where they actually bring your boat in for maintenance. But in the World Ocean Race, your goal is to race around the world in a sailboat between one and three people sailing it in six months. And there is a specific leg of the World Ocean Race that is from the tip of Southern Africa all the way underneath Australia beyond the tip of South America to Brazil. That is a single leg in the world ocean race. And in that, in that distance, if you, if you didn't know, it's 12,750 nautical miles. Now, in the course of that leg, you only pass about four major land masses. So most of the time, you're in bitterly cold water just trying your best to stay your course. You are trying your very best to just keep on the right course. And if you are on this, you're gonna be checking your course regularly. Again, there's nothing you're really looking at except for deep ocean water that's pretty rough and bitterly cold for literally a month. And so you're gonna be checking your course consistently because if, if you don't, well, then you may not end up to your destination. In fact, over this distance, if you look at that from the tip of Africa to the tip of South America, if you were off by just three degrees, just three degrees off from the start to end, do you know how far off you end up? You end up 510 miles from where you want to be. And for reference, the state of Tennessee from the southernmost point of Memphis to far beyond Knoxville is just at 510 miles. So you literally have the entire state of Tennessee that you could miss. That little distance between the tip of South America and Antarctica is 522 miles. You may hit Antarctica if you were off by just three degrees over that distance. Or it's actually from this church building to past Jacksonville, Florida. That's the distance we're talking about if you're off by just three degrees, just a little bit. So the people that run this race every year, they are constantly checking to see if they're on the right course. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's us. Because guess what? We don't always have the landmarks that we can see on our journey towards God. We can't see the destination, just like there's no chance these people can see Brazil. They can't even see an American continent when they start. So for us, I want us to think about the course corrections that these people would have to make, just like the course corrections that we all have to make in our daily walk with Jesus. Today, I'm gonna to talk about how Christians need to make course corrections in their lives. We all need to be able to evaluate ourselves and where we're headed in this life. We need to be able to assess whether or not our own actions and motives are centered on Christ. So let's start by, with, let's start by looking at the verses that we looked at today for the scripture reading. In the scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24 says, But you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which, is in the, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness 
of the truth. Now we're going to come back to this verse at the very end of the lesson too, but I want you to notice here it says that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self. The renewing of our mind daily to put on that new self are these small course corrections that I'm going to be talking about today. It's the renewing of our mind to put away that old that old life which is being corrupt in according to these verses and to put on that new life. First John chapter two says, by this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. In order for us to put off that old life, we need to walk as Jesus did. As our Lord and savior did, we need to walk as Jesus did. And then finally in first Corinthians, Paul writes, be imitators of me, just also I, just as I also am of Christ. The people in Paul's times that he's writing to didn't have the benefit of the written word like we have it today. They didn't get to see everything written down so plainly and nicely in bound leather format to live by. They didn't have that. So Paul's encouraged them, hey, if you see me, just be like me because I'm trying to be like Christ. We can see Christ in scripture. We can be like Paul, but ultimately we are actually supposed to be like Christ. And so all of us might need to make course corrections in our life to be more like Christ. Because ladies and gentlemen, we're all headed to the cross. We're all headed to bow before the great God and Father and to bow our knee in judgment one day. And we want to make sure we are on a path that leads us directly to God. Our goal is to live a life like Christ. So, in order to live a life like Christ, we're going to look at people who were trying to live like Christ, but who also had to make some small course correction or even some big course corrections. So let's look at some of these course corrections in Scripture. The easy, low-hanging fruit is Peter. Let's look at Peter and see what happened to him. In Peter, let's turn Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Look at this correction. Jesus himself had to correct Peter in this situation. The statement to Peter is a correction in how Peter was supposed to understand what Jesus was actually saying. So I want to just take a moment. Again, Think about what Peter's seen at this point to give him a little bit of a defense here. Peter has literally seen the impossible happen. He has seen things come from nothing. He has seen blind people healed. He has seen things that are absolutely impossible to do. And so at this point in Jesus and in Peter's life, he probably thinks Jesus can do whatever he wants. But whenever Jesus starts talking about dying to the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed, Peter's probably thinking like, no, you, you don't have to let any of that happen. Like, I've seen you do miraculous things. You don't have to. But what Peter didn't realize was the full scope of what the Old Testament prophesied, that the lamb would come to be slain for all. And so Jesus has to tell him, Peter, that is not what this is about. It is not about my will. It's about God's will. And so Peter had to be reminded that the most important thing is for God's will to be done. You are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. 
So ladies and gentlemen, we have to remember that even Peter had to be corrected to not think about what was in his own interest, what was on his mind, what was be best for him, but what was what? But what was best for God? And ladies and gentlemen, this is a correction for all of us too in verse 24, because it specifically says for us, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now we can read that very quickly, but if you look at that, those are three major things. First off, denying yourself. That's a difficult thing to do, especially today, especially for us and in this country. We are a self-centered country, to be honest with you. Everything is about what is best for me, what can I get, what, what is, what, you know, what's coming to me. We must deny ourself. Then, after you've emptied yourself, take up your cross. The, the literal cross that Jesus had to bear was an extreme burden for him physically. He had been beaten at that point, but to take on that cross was a very difficult thing. And all of us have things in our lives that are difficult to handle. So you have to empty yourself, then you have to take on the cross, and then you can walk with Jesus down the path. That is for each and every one of us. Ladies and gentlemen, those are corrections for us. Deny ourselves, take up that, is, that cross for us, and follow him. And so we see another example. Here, let's look at another example for Peter. In John chapter 13, verses 5 through 9, the scripture reads, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize now but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. But Jesus answered to him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Again, this is very close to the end of Jesus's life. We are, you know, within hours of him being betrayed. We are less than a day away from him being crucified. And here he is kneeling at the feet of his, of, of his apostles, washing them. Even in this moment where Jesus has humbled himself and is washing him, now he is having a chance to correct Peter again. Because Peter, again, isn't realizing what is happening. Peter doesn't realize that in order to be with Jesus, Jesus must do them, must do this to show how to serve others. How we have to, again, empty ourselves and serve others. Jesus washed the feet of him. But then I do want us to notice, once Peter realized what was happening, and he realized that Jesus did have to wash his feet, and he was going to follow him, look at Peter's zeal right after he's corrected. Peter says to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. He was willing to jump in with literally his whole body at this moment and to say, yes, Lord, then I am with you. This is what we should be doing when we are corrected. When we are corrected, when we realize our life is not the right way, we should not think to ourselves, okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. I'll try to work it out next month when I'm not busy. I'm, I'm doing this thing and, and I'll work on it next year once I get a new job. No, no, no. Once we're corrected, we need to immediately try and change. And now Peter has a lot of zeal, uh, many stories of zeal in the Bible about Peter. But right here, he immediately changes. And that is something that we should all take note of. Because every single one of us are going to need to change for something in our life. There's so many different roles that we fill. There's going to be parts that are going to be difficult as we go through life. Men and women, we have a variety of roles that we might fill. Individuals, you have a variety of roles that we might fill, both with family, with the church. There's so many different ways that we are instructed to live and to live rightly. As a man, I'm instructed to be a strong man and to be a Christian for God. As a man, I'm also, as a father, I'm instructed to raise my children and not provoke them to wrath. As a man, I'm also commanded as a husband to love my wife and live with her in an understanding way, knowing that she is the weaker vessel and to help her get to Christ. There's so many different roles we have. And in those roles, I have to act different things that I have to do. 
in order to walk the path correctly. And so we all need to realize that we're going to need course correction because there's so many different ways that we have to live. And ladies and gentlemen, once you have these things or you're trying to correct, I just want you to know, once you make one correction, rough waters are still ahead of you. You don't get to just make one course correction and go. Think about those guys who were sailing from the tip of Australia, right, or from Africa. They, if they got past Africa, they got past Australia, and they're like, great, there's nothing between here and South America, and they just set their course one time and just went with it, right? Rough waters are going to blow them off course. We need to have grit and determination because, ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of rough waters that are going to try to knock us off this where we're going to have to do more course corrections to come back. Paul. In Acts chapter 9, we read of Paul's conversion, uh, or Saul's conversion uh, from, from Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, I, I'm not going to read all of this. I was going to, but I'm not going to. We see here where there is a light on the road to Damascus. Uh, Jesus says to Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? me? And he says, Paul, Saul says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And from that point on, Paul is converted. He goes to the city. Uh, he sees the prophet. His sight's regained. And then he lives, starts to live a life for Jesus. Okay? Saul, or Paul in this instance, Paul, I'm going to go with Paul now. Uh, Paul decided at that point to live his life. Right? He decided, this is where I'm headed. So he starts going. He starts converting people. And we see Paul's converted and served to God. But we see in Acts chapter 14, in Acts chapter 14, if you look, starting in verse 19, it says, But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, right here, Paul was followed and then beaten. I should have changed that to stoned. He was stoned, actually. Paul was followed and stoned for trying to convert people to God. Would you not consider that some rough waters? When people are literally following you to try and kill you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what's really interesting about this is if you look for the context in this at about verse eight, we see here that he's in the city of Lystra. And not only that, he performs a miracle. He performs a miracle and heals someone and he heals them, and everybody sees this. They don't deny that it's from God. In fact, they think Paul is a God. They think, look at this man and this miracle he did. He must be a God. So they start to think that he's a God. So they're going to begin to worship him, and he literally has to stop them and say, no, don't worship me. Worship God the Father. And then in like one verse, it says, but then the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, having won over the crowds. They stoned him. In one verse, you have people that have followed him from between 10 and 60 miles. And they followed him and they, they changed the people's minds. He thought it was going great. And then these people came and they beat him to nearly death. Again, he was dragged out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Just dragged out this lifeless corpse. They thought they had killed him. They were good. They're going back to, to worship whoever they wanted to worship. Talk about some rough waters. But what does it say that he, he does right after this? Um, verse 20, it's amazing. But while the disciples stood around him, again, stood around him, he's still on the ground here, he got up and entered the city. The next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derby. He just got up and kept going. He didn't think of anything. He, he just got up and kept going because his singular goal in life at that point is to preach the gospel that Jesus wanted him to preach and to live a life for Jesus. That is some rough waters. And then we've all, we're have all we all familiar with these verses where it talks about Paul's other physical suffering and pain. These are some rough waters he had to deal with. Read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, in verse, starting in verse 24, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food in cold and exposure." 
Don't you think that sometimes Paul, maybe while he was getting that 36th lash from a whip, was having some trouble? Don't you think sometimes he was probably like, man, is this really worth it? Is this really worth it? As he was shipwrecked, as he was in the sea night and day, as he had dangers from all around him, many sleepless nights, hungry and in cold. But guess what? He stayed the course. He absolutely stayed the course, and God rewards him for that. There might be physical pain and suffering for us, but all of us have to stay the course. We have to get on the, the course that leads us to God. And so this is where the rubber meets the road, people. This is where it actually, we talk about how to make these course corrections because everybody needs to. We've seen an apostle and friend of Jesus need these course corrections. We've seen Paul, one of the greatest writers in the New Testament, need uh, uh, or go through rough waters in order to stay this course, but how do we make course corrections? I believe there are four keys for us making the right course corrections, making changes. Number one, identify the part of your life that needs to change and write it down. So ladies and gentlemen, again, this is absolutely, if you're taking notes, this is the part I really want you to write down because this is what I would like us to do in our life. We need to figure out where are we off course and how far. Because I can't answer that for you. I can only answer that for me. I can only know how Justin is doing. I can only know where my heart is. I can only know what sins that I struggle with. But for you, that's different. And so in order for us to change, in order for us to make these course corrections, first and foremost, we have to identify what is keeping us from living a Christ-like life. And how far off are we? Some of us might have major course corrections that need to be done. Some of us might have minor course corrections that need to be done, but all of us have these course corrections that need to be done. And then next, you need to write this down. You need to write it down. I wrote it down personally on my note in my phone. There's a little app that I keep notes on. I wrote mine down there because I know there's a way that I need to change. And so I've written it down so that I can identify it and work on it. For example, and this is mine. I need to get my anger under control. I know I don't come across as an angry person. I know I don't. I have smiles here. I love being here. But ladies and gentlemen, at times, I get extremely angry and very frustrated. Last night, the dog, I lost it. That dog, ugh, sometimes. But I lost it, and I was mad at the dog, and guess what? I spoke with anger to my wife. So for me, this is number one. I wrote it down because I need to change it. Maybe your example is I want to be more patient and kind with my spouse. Well, kind to my spouse, that's kind of for me too with the angry, angry words. Maybe you need to be more patient. Maybe you're that person that is just, isn't willing to wait for anything in life. Maybe yours is you should be less selfish and more content. I know a lot of us look around, and again, I've, I've spoken about this before, but there's so much money around us in this world. Ladies and gentlemen, there's wealth all around us, and it's hard to be content with sometimes what we have. Maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it's just, I have to stop doing this. I left that one blank because there's so many things you could enter into that blank that you might need to change in your life. I just have to stop doing this. If I could get this under control, I could do it. I could be on that right path and I could be directly towards God. Write it down. Please write it down. And after you write it down, the next thing you're going to write down right underneath it is you're going to identify a specific task that will help you make that change. A specific task. You're going to write it down again right underneath it. So if we go back to the example, I need to get my anger under control. Maybe I have written down right here in my phone, I will not speak for 20 seconds when I become angry. Maybe it's just as simple as that, a specific way, a real tangible thing that you can do in order to change your life for this, uh, this area where you've identified you need to change. If it's I want to be more patient and kind with my spouse or children, maybe you should write down, before I speak to my family, I will think of how Jesus treated others. 
and the love and compassion that flowed from our Savior's lips. I should be less selfish and more content. Maybe that turns into, I will do at least one selfless act each day and pray for contentment. One specific task, pray each morning for contentment. Or I have to stop this might turn into, every time I'm about to do this, I will instead do this. Every time I'm about to fall into the temptation of blank, I will do this instead. You have a plan. You know what you're going to do. And again, that can be a lot of different things, so I left it blank for you. The third key is to start small every day. Start small with these two items that you've written down and give yourself credit every time you accomplish it. So if we go back to our examples again, I need to get my anger under control. I will not speak, not even just 20 seconds. I'm not gonna speak for five seconds and I'll walk away if angry. Just five seconds in order to try and control my anger. That is a very specific task that you could do. If you could start small, you can gain momentum. I want to be more patient. Turns into, I will read just one verse about kindness every day. Just one verse. The next one might be, I will let others go ahead of me in this area of my life. Or I will pray for contentment each morning. Whatever it is to be more selfless. And again, I have to stop this. Turns into, I will say aloud every morning, I will not do this. I will not let Satan tempt me in this. Dear God in heaven, help me not to do this. Just once, every morning. What did that take me, four seconds to say that? And that if you started your day with that, it can be of benefit to you to conquer it throughout the day. And then finally, we need to lean on and involve other Christians so they can help you. This is the most underrated key. Now, these other pieces, you're going to find these in books. You're going to find these in a lot of world literature, self-help books, how to change books, um, how to be, you know, a better, I don't know, how to get more physically fit, right? Whatever it is, a lot of these keys are in those books. But this last one is not. But it is very much in the Bible. It is very much in the Bible. Look at 1 Thessalonians with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 5. Uh, I'm going to read 11, the last half of 13 and 14. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. 13, live in peace with one another. 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Verse 11 again, encourage one another and build up one another. We do not lean on each other as much as we should. We just don't. We need to be in the lives of the people in this building. We need to be in the lives actively so that we can help them genuinely. Genuinely. It's not a, how are you? How's the family? How's the dog that you're mad at? It's none of that. It's, hey, are you still doing okay? I, hey, hey. I know you've been struggling with this. We talked about that last week. How are you? Are you okay? It's those conversations that you have to have. It's those conversations that encourage and build us up. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. I love that verse. Hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Yes, sin is deceitful because it is killing us and we don't realize it. But to combat that, we are to encourage one another day after day. We are to help each other and beat that deceitfulness of sin. We are to lean on each other and help each other. Classic verse, 27, 17 in Proverbs, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We sharpen each other, we keep each other strong and sharp to fight against Satan, to fight against the devil that is honestly trying to get all of us, every person here, every single one of us. But we can lean on each other. We can absolutely lean on each other. And then my final verse of the whole morning, Hebrews 10, 23, 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another 
to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Ladies and gentlemen, if we are going to make these course corrections in our lives, we are to use one another. We are to encourage and build up one another. We are to absolutely lean on each other, just as the apostles leaned on Jesus. They leaned to him and looked to him for help. Ladies and gentlemen, we can lean on each other and look to each other for help because we're supposed to stimulate us to love and good works. So we've talked this morning about course corrections. We've seen that Jesus' apostles need them. We saw that there would be rough waters ahead of all of us. And we've seen that in order to make these course corrections, I encourage you to write them down, find specific tasks to accomplish them, and then lean on each other in order to do it. So now I want to go back to the very first verse we started with, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest course correction that each of us has to do very first is to lay aside the old self. We have to lay aside that old self because it is dying and it is actually already dead and you don't even know it. If you are not in Jesus Christ, then you have no hope after this life is over. You have just no hope. But in Jesus, we put on a new life and we put on eternal life through him. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's any need that you need this morning to give your life to Christ, to come to him, to be baptized, and to live a life with him, then you have the opportunity in just a moment when we stand and sing. All you have to do is walk down the aisle and come forward. And for those of us who, are already, who have already been baptized, who have already put on Christ, ladies and gentlemen, if you need help in some corrections to your course, if you need help making changes in your life, if there's something that's been bothering you and you want us to help, this is for you too. This is for you too. You come down to the front when we stand and sing in a moment and you just let us know and we'll pray for you. We will be there for you and we will help you every way we can. If there's any need, please come now as we stand and sing.